Hello and welcome to SciShow Talk Show, that day on SciShow where we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff. Today we're talking to Dan Reisenfeld, professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Montana, who has worked on a number of space missions, currently working on yes. one, maybe two, kind of. Three, actually. Oh, jeez. <laughs> right now, uh, Cassini is in the news, and I see also on your shirt. Yes. Which is a probe that has been hanging out around Saturn for a long time now. When was the launch? It was in like... The launch was in 1997. Oh my gosh. And it took seven years to get to Saturn. And it's just about to end its mission, which is why it it's is. starting to be more in the news. You've got two, two other missions right. that you're yes. actively working on? Mm-hmm. Okay. There's the... Um, IBEX mission, which stands for Interstellar Boundary Explorer, Mm -hmm. and it's currently orbiting the Earth, but it's studying the region in space where our solar system ends and the rest of the galaxy begins. So you say it's exploring the boundary, yes, the interstellar boundary, but it's not really exploring it, it's just looking at it, studying it. Fair point. Yeah. Okay, yes. (laughs) But but IBEX is a really good name, so let's not mess with it. Well, it's part of the Explorer um, program at NASA. There's a lot of explorers, starting with Explorer 1 way back in the, sure, okay. yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. the first thing that we mm-hmm. put in space. Mm-hmm. And it's been going on ever since, so there's uh, one of the many Explorer missions. Cool. And the other one? The other one is Genesis, which is a discovery mission. And Genesis is was actually launched in 2001, and it went into space and was stationed at a point between where the Earth's and Sun's gravity cancel, mm-hmm. called the L1 point. Mm-hmm. It uh, sampled the solar wind for two and a half years. Basically, the solar wind came in and it had these collectors which were deployed uh, with a bunch of tiles on them. And solar wind particles which travel at hundreds of kilometers per second mm-hmm. crashed into these tiles and embedded themselves in. And then the whole thing folded itself back up and came back to Earth oh, wow. in 2004. And um, it was supposed to have a soft landing in the Utah desert. Uh Parachutes were going to be deployed and a helicopter was going to snatch it up out of the air. But then the parachutes didn't deploy. It implanted itself into the Utah desert. (laughs) But uh, so... So you uh, just got a bunch of dust that you're studying. Well, not... Pieces of tile. The tile pieces were... were, They were fragmented, but they were still in fragments. And fortunately, the solar wind embeds itself so deeply into it that it's easy to distinguish between the solar wind and Utah. They are shared (laughs) with laboratories around the world. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you can do a much better job of figuring out the uh, abundances of the elements Mm -hmm. that make up the solar wind in a ground-based laboratory than you can right. in space. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the ultimate goal of the mission is to understand the primordial composition of our solar system. Because 99.9% of the mass of our solar system is in the sun. Mm-hmm. So if you know the solar composition, then you will know the primordial uh, planetary so, solar system. I mean, you always hear like, like the percentages of elements in the sun. Yep. You, like it's this much hydrogen, this much helium, yes. this much other stuff. And, uh, but well, we don't know how much molybdenum is in the sun. <laughs> say that <laughs> three, say three times fast. I did molybdenum. <laughs> and uh, so, so the whole periodic table exists in the sun. Right. Does it? Yes. Wait. No, really. Not yes. the whole periodic because there's well, a bunch not of elements the, that we okay. just made up. Not the radioactive, yeah. unstable ones, yeah. but yeah. up to uranium. Yeah, all the trans- everything uranium. up. Yeah. Yes, everything up to uranium is in the is is any stable or anything that has a half time right. half life of more than yeah, a like few billion years. Is also, yes, just because. Yes. So you're finding you're figuring out like all the percentages of all the things because like these atoms are getting thrown out of the sun. Right. Whenever, like all the time, continuously yeah. at a steady sort of. Pace called yeah. it's called the solar wind, yeah. and uh, it carries out with it everything. The trick is, and the reason I'm still employed, I don't <laughs> I don't do the analysis in the laboratory of the samples. Mm-hmm. I'm a solar physicist. The abundances in the solar wind aren't quite the same as the abundances in the sun itself, and there has to be a correction made mm-hmm. to understand the fractionation between the sun and the solar wind, and so that's where I come in is. I help interpret the laboratory results mm-hmm. to under to translate the solar abundances that they're measuring. Sorry, the solar wind abundances mm-hmm. that they're measuring to the solar abundance that ultimately is what they seek. And then, is there another person who then tries to figure out what the sun was like four and a half billion years ago? Because it, I imagine the composition has changed. It with has all not of- composition changed. Not the outer surfaces of the sun. Only the core of the sun is their change, and there's no mixing with the core. What? There's no mixing with the core. The core of the sun does not mix with the outside of the with, no. the with the surface of the sun ever. It must eventually. Not in our sun, no. 
Other stars maybe do have mixing all the way down to the convection, yeah. but our, we have a convection zone yeah. that goes about 30% of the depth of the sun. And so the top 30% of the sun is mixed continuously. But okay. then we go into the radiative zone, which is radiatively stable, meaning that it doesn't, it just is static. And wow. so all the fusion, which How is How the heck do you know that, Dan? <laughs> yeah, I don't because I read it in a book. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> and by you, I, I mean took a course by, called by you, I mean us humans. Humans, how, how do, do we know this? That? Well, I mean, in a way, um, stars are very simple. I mean, they start out as, as far as their uh, behavior is concerned, they start as big balls of hydrogen and some helium, and all the other stuff that I was just been talking mm -hmm. about doesn't really play much an effect in the evolution of the star although it does to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, you just have a big ball of hydrogen, and the only thing that distinguishes one star from another star, for the most part, is its mass, how much, mm -hmm. how much hydrogen came together in the first place. And so then you just throw the laws of physics at it and let it evolve in a computer simulation right, okay. or something, and then you figure it out. Now, we do have ways of checking our models, though, because the sun does give out something called neutrinos which are part of the nuclear reactions that occur, occur in the core of the sun. Mm -hmm. And we can detect those neutrinos. And the neutrino number, how many neutrinos we detect, are related to these models. And so we can right. correct or You're like, oh, check our models. Like it's, it's about right. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's a layer of the sun that hasn't changed in four and a half, like the composition hasn't correct. changed in four and a half billion. It's just hot. It's not even fusioning. Right. Ah. You got it. So you're doing that. Mm, but then that's Genesis, right? Yeah. Yes. But then you've got Ibex, and then there's Ibex. We're gonna get to Cassini, I promise. <laughs> uh, but there's, there's, so well, yes. it's also good to talk about the things people aren't necessarily talking about right now. And this is your learning about the basically the, the boundary between our solar system and then our our not our solar system anymore, which is not right. necessarily an easy place to distinguish. And it is always like every I feel like every two years people are like Voyager has left the solar system, and I was right. like that happened. That yes. already happened. Yes. Uh, yes. But in fact, Voy the, the Voyager <coughs> team, the, the scientists on the Voyager mission, mm -hmm. which is still going on and yeah. still operating, Crazy. Uh, and our team, the Ibex team, we uh, interact quite a lot. Right. Because they're, they're the out there actually exploring and having right. some data. So you're getting single point measurements as right. they pew, go yeah. through this interstellar boundary region. Uh -huh. And it has different layers to it, which is why you hear different, yeah. like the first exciting thing that Voyager did was it got to what's called the termination shock which is sort of a fancy word for the innermost layer of the boundary region. Uh, Technically, and, and, it's a place where the solar wind goes from being supersonic to subsonic. Okay. So how do you study that, that layer without being there? Well, um, so... Because we, IBEX is just orbiting Earth. Or is IBEX it, is, is orbiting is, is Earth. Is it a space telescope? Like, what is it? Well, it's, it, it's a telescope, but it's not, not detecting light. light. Okay. Yes, it's, detect, it's, it's looking at neutral neutralized atoms. We have a name for it, we call them energetic neutral atoms. Mm -hmm. But basically they're solar wind particles that went out as mm -hmm. ions, and then when they interacted with the interstellar gas, they became neutralized, and their trajectories uh, carry them around the magnetic field that's out there, and they spiral around when the magnetic field. When they're still ions. When they're ions. Okay. And when they become neutralized, if they happen to be pointing in this direction, when that happens, then they just travel in a straight line. So like that moment that us. they're neutralized, they have sort of an equal chance of going in every direction. Yes. And some of them head back to us, and right. then you are detecting these energetic neutral somethings. Atoms. Atoms. Yes. I mean... We call them ENAs. And so you can... What can you tell from them? You can tell their trajectory, you can tell their... Energy, their, their speed, basically. Is right. That what they, you well, we measure their right. We measure their energy, their their kinetic energy, mm -hmm. and um, we know where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. and, and our instrument has different energy channels so that we can look at their energy distribution, we, and also their density. How many are coming? Mm -hmm. Tell us something about the density of the region that they are being right. formed in. And are you looking in all directions, not yes. just at the? It takes nose. six months for us to map out the whole sky once, okay. and we'd make these sky maps of this boundary layer. Mm. And it's been doing this since the beginning of 2009, so we are on our eighth sky map now. And so you can can you see the the sort of wake that's being formed mm -hmm. as the sun plows through this right, yes. interstellar yeah. medium. But it's kind of like imaging the skin of a bubble from the inside. Right. It's a very thin region of space compared to mm -hmm. the solar system scale. And so we're still, in fact, learning how to interpret our data because right. there's no data set like it. And is it is it a super thin region? Like like all of these you know, ions get neutralized 
roughly at the same area of space? Well, from, on the scale of, the, of right. this region, yes, but it's still thick compared to, say, the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Okay. It's about maybe, I'm gonna go with 50 times, actually, oh, that okay. thickness. So, that's a, so it's still pretty yeah. thick, beefy area. Okay, fascinating. How's Cassini? <laughs> Just you, fine, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite Saturn moon? Enceladus. Yeah, yeah. and so is this, is that's the watery one? The, is that the ice yes. one? Yeah. Well, it's the one that's spewing water out right. into space, yes. Many so of the moons have a lot of water on them. Right, but, they, but is, is Enceladus like, a, like 100% ice? On Not 100%, oh, okay. but it's, it's, I mean, it has a, a, a rocky core. Oh, right, but it, on the surface. The surface is entirely yeah. encased in ice, yes. And there's some kind of probably salty ocean hanging out down there. We think so now, yeah. And that's new Cassini information. Yes, I mean, we've started, we basically knew something had like that had to be going on with Cassini when Cassini discovered these mm -hmm. plumes of water shooting out of the South Pole right. of Enceladus in 2005 when. Yeah. Uh, Were you working on Cassini then? Yes. Was that a good moment? Yeah, no, <laughs> that was fantastic. I, 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 the way, there's a really interesting story about how the water was discovered because okay. Um, ultimately, we actually could make take images of these plumes, but originally it was the magnetometer team that discovered that something was up with Enceladus. Up until Cassini, Enceladus was just one of Saturn's many moons and nobody mm -hmm. particularly thought there was going to be anything exciting going on there. And then when we did a relatively close flyby of uh, Enceladus early in the mission, the magnetometer team noticed a bleep in their data that they were measuring Saturn's magnetic field, and for some mm -hmm. reason, the field was being significantly distorted when it got near Enceladus. And nobody expected that, because in order to do that, magnetic fields to be affected need to be interacting with a plasma or something. Mm -hmm. And so this implied that there was a plasma around Enceladus, a fairly dense plasma. And so that was like, hmm, why would there be a plasma around Enceladus? And mm -hmm. so then, uh, a couple orbits later, they redirected this Cassini spacecraft so that it made a much closer approach. And then our instrument, which was or is a ion mass spectrometer, it detected the existence of lots of ionized water molecules right near Enceladus. Now, we were seeing water molecules actually all over the place, but the density of water went way up when we got near Enceladus. Right. And so that was like, oh, really? That's really interesting. So we now know that there is a water, watery uh, atmosphere mm -hmm. around Enceladus. And then finally, the cameras were able to detect these plumes coming. Uh, there's fissures in the mm -hmm. ice near the South Pole, and jets of water were shooting out of it like geysers. So it's like Yellowstone National Park there. And like with enough velocity that they like escape. Oh, yeah. The, the moon. Right, yes, yes. Which is, I mean, I guess it's not They're a super... very high speed of like yeah. 200 kilometers per second or so. Wow. So then it shoots out and it hangs out around the planet, and then does it be like the solar wind like plasmify it somehow? Is that why it's interacting with the magnetic field of Saturn? Well, when it shoots out, it's neutral. You're right. You're right. And then it, it gets ionized because um, Saturn has a very strong magnetic field, mm -hmm. and it, it has, Saturn has what we call a magnetosphere which is a region of space. The Earth has a magnetosphere and Jupiter has a magnetosphere. Mm -hmm. Those are the three big ones in our solar system. And it's a region where the magnetic field of the planet traps ions and electrons. Mm -hmm. And these ions and electrons can become very energetic and they can ionize neutral atoms. And so once the water shoots out from Enceladus, mm -hmm. mostly electrons will hit these water molecules and ionize them. And so then they become Ions. And that was our first clue that there was maybe a liquid ocean. Well, obviously there's neutral, I mean, you know, well, yeah, neutral yeah. water coming right. out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that implies there is a heat source and mm -hmm. that it would be liquid somewhere. Yeah. At first we didn't know if there were little <clears throat> pockets of right. water or if it was something more, you know, moon wide, mm -hmm. but later analysis of um, gravity, they, they can de determine the strength of gravity right. uh, around the, the moon, mm -hmm. and this led them to infer the existence of a, of a whole ocean underneath the surface of the like ice. There's ice, ocean, rock. Yeah. And you could sort of tell the density, and so you're guessing that something is bringing density up, so it 
not just water. Correct, yes. I don't know that we know that much about how the solar system as a whole formed and then you know, the, the systems around the gas giants of these big interesting moons, how they formed, but it seems like they probably formed around the same time as the planets. It's interesting mm -hmm. to me that there would be some that are so, like that their compositions are so different and that there would be one that is, and this is the case for Jupiter too, that is just like way more water than all the rest of them. So you mean Enceladus has way more water? Than all than the rest of the, of the Saturn moons. Actually, we don't know that. I mean, okay. the, a lot of them, water is very abundant in the uh, solar system, it turns out. And uh, I mean, what makes Enceladus special is that it's active in such mm -hmm. a way that the water is in a liquid state. Right. Other moons also have a lot of water. Is, there is a lot of ice hanging out, but it's just, it's these ice ball, like these snowball moons that are just like, it seems like they're mostly water. Well, yeah, and yes, and I, and I don't know enough about planetary yeah. formation to yeah. explain why some have so much more than others. But even Titan has a lot of water on it. It's, it's, but Titan is so cold that the water is Basically, right. in a, a rocky yeah, rock. state. Yeah. yeah, it's like Pluto, where it's like right. rocky, sandy rock. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like we could talk all day. Sure. But <laughs> I would uh, also like to introduce you to some kind of animal. Okay. I don't know what it is. Okay. I feel like I've heard a bird. Uh huh. So it might be that. <laughs> all right. Two of them. Oh. Yeah. There is two of them. They're birds. That two. And you did hear that, right? These I guys are right. birds. This is Maui. Would you like to yes. hold her? Thank you. You can give her seeds all you want. So these guys are both green cheek conyers, but you can see they look yeah. similar but different colors. So this is ginger here is uh, the natural coloration, and uh, this is what you'd find in the wild. So this is a weird coloration because it's not tons and tons not, of not green cheeks. So yeah, so she has a green cheeks, and you can see she does have green cheeks, they're just lighter green. So if she was born in the wild, she would not, there, there we go. It's okay. She uh, would not survive. Oh, man. Oh, baby girl. It's okay, there's Come mommy, there's mommy. Come near you, you want mm. my shoulder? Okay. Yeah, there you go. Go. She would not okay. survive. <laughs> she would not survive because she'd be like a really big neon sign saying "Eat me." Oh. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> she she, uh, she does not have a naturalistic coloration. So she would not pass on. There would be a very low probability of her passing mm -hmm. on her right. her genes and making more of these. But since she was born in captivity, she survives, and uh, we can get these really interesting color mutations. I think there's six different color mutations of the green cheek conure. The reason we get them is the we're able to get the mutations is because these guys are really prolific breeders and they do well <laughs> in captivity. And so people, you know, they have them as pets. Mm -hmm. And they, they, you know, they're small, they're quiet, relatively quiet for a parakeet. For a conure, yeah. <laughs> they're pretty docile. And I'm gonna say that and anyone in the that's watching this that has one, they're gonna be like, no, mine attacks my finger all the time. Because they can, they can be quite bitey when they're young. They got strong, strong jaws and yeah. pointy beaks. Hi, baby girl. I like their eyes. Isn't that neat? white around their eyes. Yeah. So cool. conures have that um, bare skin around their eyes like that. Uh -huh. um, so do you know, I think might know, do you know the difference between a parrot and a parakeet? I used to. Yeah? But I don't know anymore. Do you know? Oh gosh. They're bigger. Parrots are bigger. No. No. False. Oh, see, right there. <laughs> <laughs> so there are Stick to my the field. smallest parrot in the world is a pygmy parrot. It's really? about this big. The oh. parrot let is the second smallest, and it's about that big. So and then there's big parakeets. Right. Uh, I can't remember. It's their tail. Okay. It's their tail. So if they have a long tail, it makes them a parakeet. If they have a shorter tail, it's it's their parrot. Oh wow. Well. Um, so these guys are a parakeet from South America, so we call them a conure. So they're often called green cheek conures um, or green cheek parakeets. You want to do a little dance? Oh, that's <laughs> quite yeah. a dance. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny when I, so I have a child now and I'm always looking at animals and I'm like, okay. It's smarter than my child. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, When's the crossover this, point? At this point. Yes. At this yeah. point right? right. So like like a one to two year old. Yeah. That's, that's kind of where we're at with these guys. I mean, if you can equate different right. species. Yeah. But if you notice, I'm holding them different. Mm -hmm. So I was having you um, mm -hmm. hold Maui, and you can see that she perches really well with her feet. Can you see what's wrong with Ginger's feet? Oh yeah. Feet? You don't have any claws. Yeah. So. Um, I That's am assuming fun. her parents huh. groomed them off of her. That's what I, I oh. think is what happened. Um, her parents? Yeah, you mean her actual, her, her actual parents, not, um, not her owners, yeah. 
Um, so sometimes if they, you know, are born in captivity and they don't really know how to be parrots, uh, they will overgroom or they're stressed out. They'll mm. overgroom and they'll end up like trying to groom huh. a little hard nail off their soft toes. Um, but she also has malformed <laughs> toes and she can't can't perch very well. Um, she's fully flighted, and so what I want to do is see if she wants to fly to me from you to me. Okay. So I do have to warn you, she, she's not super fond of other people. So don't try and like pet her or anything. Okay. But if you cup your hands, I'll set her in your hands, and then I'm gonna walk over there. Okay. And we'll see. So put your hands on the other side of the chair. Other side, this side. Right there. So yeah. you're gonna get up and. Yeah. Get up so there. I'm gonna stand like kind of like right on the other side of you. Ready, Ginger? Ginger. Okay. And Maui's gonna think this is a heyday. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna go <laughs> take Maui here. Here we go. All right. Okay. Ready, Ginger? Here we go. You go there. Go oh there. Hey, right over here. I'm gonna fly to mom already. Ah, yes. yay. <laughs> <laughs> I, you didn't get very far away at all. No, 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 no. She, she doesn't let me go very far. <laughs> Hi, can you come back now? It's nice to be wanted. Hi. Here we go. Okay. We'll see. okay, you want my shoulder again? All right. Oh my gosh, you are such a menagerie. Isn't she good? Isn't yes. she good? You're so good. Yes, you are. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we just we're a lot of fun um, with these guys. Uh, they each have their own unique personalities, and so we're doing we're doing the best that we can for them, um, hmm. trying to support support what they need. Um, How do you like? You have so many animals that need so much attention because that's the thing. The big thing that turns out to be is, is it's harder than you would, than you thought yeah. it was going to be. Yeah, it takes more of your yeah time resources than you think. For our social animals, we work really hard to try and either give them the same species companionship or something that's compatible with them. Yeah. We do have a lot of animals that are are, are not social. They like just right. solitary. Yeah, yeah and, your, and they're, your, they're, your snakes they're don't, don't need a lot of love. No, no, and you know, we, <laughs> we've got ones that are just like, I'd rather not. Is it just you and your husband or do you have people? It was me and my helpers? husband, Augusto, for eight years. Uh -huh. We just hired another animal keeper. Oh, wow. And a uh, business manager that can now like, or, or like office manager that answers all my emails and, and, and takes some of that off my plate, which is nice. Uh, <laughs> Not all my emails, I still answer a whole bunch, but. Um, and can but provide another, companionship to <laughs> animals as well. Right? Yeah, she's there too. But the keeper, yeah. we, we also have a steady stream of interns and volunteers that come through and mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, fresh faces and they're passionate and gung-ho about learning about these guys. And so it keeps the excitement going. Yeah. She's she's kind of being antisocial. It's fine. It's fine. She's, 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 she's facing she's away from. Yeah. She's like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this is a weird place. There's a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> she might want to interact with me. Let's see, Ginger. How about we pass you off up here? Well, it's hard for yeah. Ginger. She uses she's her got, beak a lot. She's using her yeah. beak to pull herself up. All right, Maui, do you want to show off what you love to do the best? All right, Hank. Go ahead, grab a seat and hold it like this. Just one seat. Just one seat. Up like that. Ready? Oh, hey. yay. Nice. So Maui's favorite thing to do actually is to hang upside down. Like, like <laughs> this looks like a trick or something like that, but really she she does this at home oh, yeah, all dexterous. the time. And uh, these guys, they're obviously really bonded. They like each other a lot. Um, I want to. But it's really, yeah, you can get it, get in this action. Yeah. That's funny. Another one. So uh, they, uh, she can't, she can't hang upside down by her feet. Um, right. Ginger can't. Um, so Maui loves to. Maui is just bragging. Basically. She's like, ah. <laughs> but they like to hang out next to each other, and so she'll be Ginger will be sitting on a perch, and Maui will like climb up on the ceiling, and then be like, "Hi, <laughs> <laughs> what you doing?" <laughs> Good birds. It's a, it's remarkable how many animals really are social and need. You know, like group living is is a uh, the way to be. It's a, it's a strategy, but it is also like if you're. Like even if you have all your needs taken care of, if you're designed for that, you can't. And you don't have it. You, you can't go without it. it. You'll yeah. you'll become neurotic. Some some mm -hmm. mental and physical um, uh, neuroses will will happen, and uh, it's not going to be good. So yeah, it's really important when you bring an animal that's social in the wild into captivity. You have to you have to know their natural history, and you have to be able to um, supply that, provide mm -hmm. that for them. Um, even even crazy. hermit crabs. Even hermit crabs. Got to give them the hermit crab love. They need <laughs> each other. They do. You're yeah. such an upside down bird. I know. She, I, I know. mean, she literally, my arm's falling asleep. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is, this is <laughs> the best thing that's happened to me all day. 
<laughs> blood rushing like to my she, head. She stand straight up. Do you want to try holding her upside down? Sure. Okay. Just throw that on there. Yeah. Okay, so she, the thing is she has to point towards you. Okay. Put your thumb on her toe. Mm. And then tip her upside down. So she has to point towards you. So there we go. Thumb on her toe. Thumb on her toe. Now tip her all the way upside down. There you go. Okay. That's awesome. Jealous, jealous bird up here. You can have some seats too. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Want some more seats? <laughs> is this uh, is this hand placement important? Am I going to drop her? She will hold on to you. Okay. If you drop her, she'll she'll flutter. Okay. If you do that to a turkey, they fall asleep or they go very right. dormant. Yeah. Too if you much put them on your back, they can't breathe right. They don't. Yeah. They, they um, it's difficult for them to breathe. Chickens will do the same thing. Uh -huh. you, you lay them down on their back um, or upside down, and yeah, they'll just. Whoa. Do you want a few seats? She'll take a seat from you, sure. so just pinch it. All right. I know. And hold it right towards her face. Hi. Yes. Oh, you're being friendly today. Yay. <laughs> another one? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's I another know. thing. You say these guys are super happy. Well, you know, who's not happy when they're eating their favorite treats? That's right. <laughs> I mean, they could they could be so nervous. I just had a bunch of jalapeno but... chips. I'm super happy. Super content? Yeah. <clears throat> so when you say they need a lot of attention, how much attention a day? Do they um, need or hours. Get? You should be home. I mean, if you work a, a nine to five job Monday through Friday and you're their sole companion, uh -huh. that's not good for them. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be good enough for them. So you have to have like either someone at home all the time or, you know, um, they have to have someone home all the that's time. A, <laughs> like that's, that's, that's there's pretty no, much it. Yeah, um, so. Or you can get two. At least yeah. two, um, if they get along. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times. So does that count? Like interbird yes. attention counts. Yes, attention. definitely. The the problem that uh, people run into, or they they don't want to get to, because they will bond stronger to each other than they might to you. If you want them to bond strongly to you, then you have to be there to be mm -hmm. their number one. I'm happy when they're happy. My number one priority is their happiness. So I'm I'm stoked that these guys are our best buds. Uh, hey, Maui and Ginger, thank you for coming on my show and hanging <laughs> out. Yeah. Not pooping on me <laughs> one single <laughs> time. Just guessing. <laughs> She's used to it. You were so good, weren't you? Yeah, you, you were yeah. so excited. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Oh, Ooh. there's some. Ooh. Nice noises. She used to do the, the two bits. Yeah. No. 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 Yeah. no. I'm, I'm my own bird. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. She says nothing. She, every once in a while she'll do a tiny little peep. Peep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for coming. If you want to find out more of what Jesse's up to and see some of the cool work she does with a bunch of animals, uh, Animal Wonders Montana is her YouTube channel. Dan, this is great. So yeah, it was a pleasure. We'll have you back again, okay, um, <laughs> to talk more about space because that was fascinating. Uh, I hope sure. that you guys enjoyed it as well. If you want more talking about science, that's what we do here at YouTube.com/scishow. Mm -hmm.